Party. We've had a glowing report from Toby Perkins, your, your colleague. Um, what did he say? He basically said that people are worried about the cost of living, people are disaffected with politics and feel worried about whether or not they've got any future for their kids and there's a whole load of problems and we always knew that actually it would be difficult to get into government when we were so roundly kicked out in 2010 but actually our Labour does have the answer to people's problems and therefore we are going to be very determined, very resolved to set forth for people that there is a solution to their problems and that they can vote for Labour so, with confidence. So there's nothing new then? I mean that's what he's been saying all the time. Yeah, and it's a good line of argument. People are worried about their fuel bills and the fact that their pay is slipping back while prices are going up. And these are the very basic issues. But the issue is for them not to um, simply not vote or turn to UKIP as a sort of, you know, act of desperation, but actually to to for us to inspire confidence in them that actually they can look to Labour to be a government to sort the situation out. Well, I think the UKIP issue is something we might um, address a bit later in the hour. If you want to question, Harriet, about uh, whether Labour actually understands the UKIP threat, of course there was a by-election last week, we could talk about that as well, where Labour only won a fairly safe seat by 617 votes. The number to call, 0345 6060 973. Let's go to Dan in Chiswick. Dan, hi. Oh, hi, uh, hi, hi. Uh, um... And I've just got, I've got a question for Harriet, um, and that is simply, are you planning or when are you going to take the leadership of the Labour Party and stop Miliband from put, putting the final cof- nail of, in, the, in, the, in the Labour coffin? Well, That's exactly what he's, what he's saying. He's burying the Labour Party. Well, I, I don't think he is burying the Labour Party, far from it. You know, the truth is that, that nobody in the other parties was talking about the issues that people are concerned about, like their pay falling back and their fuel bills going up and the cost of living problem. That was something put on the agenda by Ed Miliband. And actually, he is in touch with people's concerns. We do need a Labour government to really make sure the health service doesn't carry on on the slide. And I think it's a very tough job being leader of the opposition and it's easy to point to all sorts of other people and say they would be better but actually as soon as they're in the hot seat it's evident how tough a job it is but I think that Ed Miliband has got the absolute determination and also the sense of not only what the problems are but what the solutions are so I hope that we can between now in the 200 days or something there is between the now and the next general election I hope Dan that we may might be able to inspire your confidence. Well Dan why do you think Harriet would be a better leader than Ed? Well, I just feel that Ed is just simply not a powerful or strong enough leader. And when I when I look at Harriet Harman, I see a more, more I see stronger potential as a leader and as a prime minister, and maybe even as as Labour's answer to Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, well, said the I'm, wrong thing there. I'm hoping to arise into the situation if we're elected as a deputy prime minister and that is absolutely you know has, more has, than has good that, enough for me has, thank has you that very been much. agreed because of course famously you weren't deputy prime minister under gordon brown no the situation is that the decision of who is in what ministerial post and whether there's a deputy leader and who it is is a matter for the prime minister but I am the shadow deputy. But you are expecting to be deputy prime minister, clearly, from what you just said. I, you know, it's not for me to have expectations. No, but you kind of just, just did say I that. am the shadow. I mean, uh, well, I hope to be. Okay. Let's put it like that. But you're, you're not expected to be. I'm gather there's a. But above all, soon. I hope. I, above all, I hope for us to get into government because I think things are going in the wrong direction for people, and. You know, the, 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 this coalition government has let people down in so many ways and there are, you know, so many reasons, even just one of which would be enough to justify getting this lot out. I mean, I noticed that George Osborne is just starting to say how bad things are in Europe and in the Eurozone to set up an alibi that if the economy takes a further downturn that it will be somebody else's fault, not, not his. So obviously there's even mounting concerns on the economy again. Let, let, let's try and be honest though and, and take party political hats off. Um, most people seem to think that Ed Miliband hasn't had a very good few weeks and that's putting it mildly. Um, the, the fact that he forgot those things in the conference speech really seems to have cut through to the electorate in a way that frankly I was quite surprised at. Um, 
a lot of people think that Labour might be more likely to win the next election with a different leader. You, you must have people telling you this all the time. It's always easier to admire the king across the water. It's the hardest thing to be the one in the hot seat. And actually, I do think that Ed has got what it takes. He's got the determination, the sense of what the problems are and the sense of how they need to be solved. And actually, who would have thought 2010, just when we were kicked out of government, that we'd be even people discussing the possibility of Labour getting in next time round. Usually you have to moulder in opposition for, you know, decades before you can get back in. And the fact that we are, that we've won 2,288, I think, more council seats since Ed Miliband became leader, actually on the ground we're taking taking things forward. We've got momentum and that's what's happened under his leadership. Do, do you wish in retrospect that you had stood for the leadership last time? Um, no, and I don't even want to talk about the leadership because we've got a leader, it's not me, I'm the deputy leader, and the, the issues that we need to be dealing with are the ones that, for us in the Labour Party, not you, Ian, you can deal with whatever issues you want, but I think the problems are not, um, you know, about me or anything like that. They're actually about how people are going to feel they're going further forward in their lives rather than just treading water. Because I, I think that when you eventually retire from politics, there might be a point, maybe when you're penning your memoirs, which um, I'd love to publish, uh, that you, <laughs> you might think to yourself, you know, I wish I'd done that. Um, I don't, because I'm not somebody who looks back over my shoulder and regrets and thinks, I wish I'd have done this, I wish I'd have done that. That's pointless. Um, you know, I'm not one for wringing my hands or having regrets about things. The point is to look forward and, um, OK, you're trying to strike up a deal to publish my memoirs. But it's well, going to be a bit of a while. You'll have to be waiting okay. a bit before you All get right. them. Well, we'll see if I'm still there. Um, what, what do you say to Labour MPs that have talked to you about the leadership? Because if you, if you say none of them have, I'm not sure I, in all honesty, could believe you. I don't think, you know, the, the, the reality is that we are 200 day, days away from an election. We started in a very bad place in uh, 2010, uh, people having thoroughly wanted to get rid of us. And we are, when you look at the momentum we've got in terms of when people have voted in council elections, we actually have made a lot of progress. And actually, you could be asking much more, why is it that the Tories are in such a disarray and why the Lib Dems appear to have no support, having broken all their promises. I think that the big issue we have to do is to fight the disillusion that people feel that nobody's got any okay. answers to their problems. But you would accept that several MPs have talked to you about the leadership? Um, I... I don't think they have. Nobody's... No, absolutely. People don't come up and say to me, uh, when are we going to have a different leader? No, they absolutely don't say that to me. But well, they wouldn't, would they? Because actually it would be I, daft. I, I would have, I would have well, thought... Well, no, it'd be daft would... to be, you know, having a... Well, I'm, not, I'm, not asking if, uh, I'm not asking you if there are MPs who've asked you to stand against Ed Miliband, but clearly in your day-to-day -day dealings with uh, MPs, your deputy leader of the party, it would be very odd in, this, in the current circumstances if you hadn't had conversations, if people hadn't come up to you and say, Harriet, look, I really think Ed needs to do this or that, can you pass it on, that sort of thing. Oh, well, of course people always have proposals of what we could be doing better, um, and that's an issue for all of us, and we have to listen to everybody in the team that is in the Labour MPs, the Labour councillors, our members all around the country. Of course, people talk about what we should be doing, how we can be doing things differently, how we can be doing better all the time. But one of the things that is not going to help this country or the Labour Party is having any sort of wobble or any leadership election. So that's not what we're going to be doing. OK, well, lots more to talk to Harriet about over the next 45 minutes. 0345 6060 I have to say we've got 100 of course coming in at the moment um, you can also watch us I should have said this at the beginning lbc.co.uk the cameras are on if you'd like to uh, watch us while you listen as well this is LBC it's quarter past seven this is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. Some long delays on the northbound M11. The queues start just after the North Circular, then slow all the way past the M25 up towards the exit for Harlow at Junction 7. It's been caused by a lorry which broke down earlier, partly blocking the northbound exit at Junction 7 just before the Hastingwood roundabout happened just before at 5 o'clock this evening. So that's why the queues are all the way back towards the North Circular, well over an hour to get through those queues. Very slow on the clockwise M25 after an accident involving a lorry and a car. That's between Junction 
nine Leatherhead and ten for the A3. Uh, some long queues there now, delays of around 40 minutes. Uh, long queues both ways on the M23 as well because of the road work. So just going to report of uh, a break broke down a breakdown on the exit slip to Gatwick Airport on the southbound side of the M23. So do expect some long queues there. And in Manchester, the M60 clockwise a lane shut after a lorry broke down at junction 11 for Barton and the A57. Keeping you moving. Your next travel update is in 15 minutes. LBC Travel. With GoToMeeting. Avoid traffic snarls. Discover how easy online meetings can be. Ian Dale at Drive on LBC. With RACcars.co.uk. Discover over 80,000 quality used cars for sale. Meet Kate. She runs a busy estate agent, which sees her and her team running all over town. When it came to getting company vehicles, the choice was clear. Lease it with Lex Auto Lease. Aside from being free of the burdens associated with owning a fleet outright, she was able to access stylish new models to fit her business needs. After all, in her line of work, image is everything. Join the Lex Auto Lease leasing revolution at leasingrevolution.com. If you had the heating on, you wouldn't leave the front door open, would you? And you'd close all the windows too, right? But if your loft isn't insulated, you may as well be leaving your roof open. Working with the government, British Gas is rolling out free insulation for 90% of homes that need it. You don't even need to be a British Gas customer or own your own home to be one of the millions now eligible. Call 0800 141 3222 or visit britishgas.co.uk forward slash insulation. Conditions and exclusions apply. Paul runs a successful plumbing business, but if he or his team miss an urgent customer call, it's likely they'll call a competitor. Missed calls mean missed business. Now thanks to BT One Phone, customers' calls are always answered. Paul's team update their present status on their mobiles, which shows if they're available. And they've set up a call group, so when a call comes in, it automatically goes to whoever's free to take it. BT One Phone, helping you be there when your customers need you. Search BT One Phone today. The PPI mis-selling saga has been going on for years. If you're concerned that you've left it too late to claim your PPI back, Think again. Direct Redress have claimed back millions of pounds for clients that were victims of the PPI scandal, even if you don't have any agreement numbers or original paperwork. To find out more, text the word PPI to 87121. That's PPI to 87121. Direct Redress. Experts in financial claims. Right now at Homebase, our kitchen units are half price. And until October the 26th, there's 20% off our entire range of kitchens, including Schreiber and Hygiena, when you spend over £150. Order your dream kitchen now, and we'll guarantee delivery and installation before Christmas. Homebase, make your house your home. Harriet Harman on LBC. Hello, this is Harriet Harman here on LBC, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Give me a call on 0345 6060 I'm here till 8 o'clock when Clive Bull takes over. He'll have the money hour from 9 with Sarah Willingham. He will have the money hour from 9. That's what with you Sarah said. Willingham. Oh, I thought it was from 8 o'clock. <laughs> no, Clive is from 8, but okay. from 9 it's the money hour. Oh, right. OK. That is excellent. And we are now going straight to Ian in Watford. Ian, hi, what's your question? Good evening, Harriet. Good evening. Uh, do you not think you missed the opportunity to nullify the rise of UKIP by not proposing a referendum or restrictions on the amount of EU immigration? Well, I think there's two things there. One is the question of a referendum and the other is the question of immigration. Are those are the two issues that you're concerned about, Ian? Well, no, I, do you not think you've missed the opportunity to nullify the rise of UKIP? That's the main question. Well, I think our main concern is to be setting forth what we think the problems are in this country and what our answers are to solve those problems. And I don't think that... I'm certainly not in the Labour Party and not in Parliament in order to nullify UKIP or any other political party, but actually to listen to people's concerns and put forward solutions to them. But I do think there are issues around immigration 
which are causing people concern, concerns which I share and that we do need to address. And I think that most people don't yet really know what we're saying about immigration. So let me just say... I think you're right. I think they don't know what you're saying. (laughs) Well, shall I just say what we're saying? So, um, Well, before you do, do you accept that you got it wrong in 2004 um, with the transitional arrangement? Well, the fact there weren't any transitional arrangements for uh, Polish people coming into this country. Do you accept that was a mistake? I think there was two things wrong. One is that we underestimated the number of people that would come in from Poland um, and so that kind of knocked people's confidence that we said far fewer were going to come in than actually did come in. And because of that underestimate, we hadn't put in transitional arrangements and I think we've said very clearly that was a mistake. And one of the things that we wanted to do... So Labour got it wrong? Yeah, we've said that before, and we would in the future expect that there should be transitional arrangements were any other state to come into the European Union. But I think that there are things that could be done now which could uh, improve the situation because even within the fact of having uh, labour, you know, people moving from one country to another to work or coming here to work, there are things that could be done, one of which is that we have to sort out the issue of making sure that, I always call it, it shouldn't be the free movement of criminals, it's the free movement of labour, but not the free movement of criminals. So if somebody's committed a serious criminal offence in their country of origin, they shouldn't therefore necessarily be automatically entitled as part of the European Union to come and um, live and work here. And secondly, if somebody comes here from another European Union country, and I think, you know, immigration has benefited this country over the centuries and over the decades, but if people come here from a different country and then break the rules by committing an offence... I think they should then be sent back to their own country. If people here commit offences, then that is a thoroughly bad thing, but we have to put up with them. Do do you feel a a kind of pressure, though, to out-UKIP, UKIP? Because I I have noticed the language on immigration from many Labour politicians has changed. I'm not sure the policies have changed particularly, but there's a slightly harder language now. I don't think so. I've always thought that there's no point us looking over our shoulder and deciding our position by virtue of another political party. I don't think that's the way to do politics. I'm not interested in that. My concern is what people are feeling and thinking and what their concerns are and whether we share their concerns and what we can do about it. The idea that we decide Labour Party policy in order to somehow steal a march on another Mm. party, what would be the point of that? Well, Ian, what do you want to hear from Labour on on immigration? Have you been a Labour voter in the past? No, no, I'm fairly floating. What also concerns me is, is the fact that There doesn't seem to be any pressure on the EU regarding why they allowed so many poorer countries within. Nobody seems to take any responsibility for that. Were they... What was the purpose of bringing so many poorer countries within the well, EU? Well, I, 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 if you don't mind, I'm not going to go down that line right now because I want to hear from Steve in Islington, who's got a related question. Steve, hi. Hello there. What would you like to ask? Well, uh, Harriet seems to be sidestepping every time you, you ask her what, what the, the people want. She keeps saying, oh, it's the, the cost of living and this and that. The, the main reason why you are getting where they are is because of the immigration issue. And she seems to just sidestep it and go, well... It's not, we don't really think it's a problem. Well, l- l- let's, Steve, let me just put that to Harriet. Do, do you think that's why UKIP are on the rise? Is, is immigration the main reason? Is that what you believe? Well, what people say to me when I'm saying, how are you going to vote? Are you going to vote Labour? And people very often say to me, well, you know, I'm a Labour supporter or I used to be a Labour supporter, but I'm going to vote UKIP because I think you all need a shake-up or you all need a kick on the backside. And I'm, Steve, I'm not saying that immigration is not a problem and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to duck the question. I think that we have got some answers to the problems that there are about immigration because I don't so, want so, to... So, so what, what, what answers have you got? Okay, so basically, one of the things that people are concerned about, and I share their concern, is when employers employ people from other European countries at very low rates of pay, and it undercuts the pay of people um, who, who've been living and working here and have got themselves to get a decent rate of pay, and they find themselves having their pay undercut. And I think that is a problem, and that's why having a higher minimum wage and having it strongly um, enforced and making sure 
sure that um, employers can't just have a series of agency workers that are paid less than their permanent workers. I think that would make a real difference because I don't want to see anybody um, have um, their employer undercut their wages by exploiting yeah, but, but, migrant but, but, workers. But it, That's one but, but issue. It's, it's, it's already happening and it's not going to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if you stop the migration. You can't just say, oh, you're worried about people getting their, their wages being undercut. It's been going on since, since Tony Blair opened up the doors. There is no way in the world that, that we can stop all this if we don't stop the migration. And, and you're, you're, so the Labour Party is saying you're not going to have a, a, an in-out referendum. And, and you, you, absolutely not. You, you, you've avoided talking about it. Ed didn't even mention it when he when he done his uh, talk at, at your conference. Well, quite a few and things he didn't is, mention. Well, exactly. But this is the thing. He he, you, you just completely swipe it aside and go, no, no, no. There's there's no there's no problem with this. There's no problem with this. The Labour government's done it. They've caused it. We cannot take five hundred thousand people a year for the next five. Now, if we get in a referendum in in, in seventeen two seventeen. Then there's another another million people or nearly already turned. And, and Steve, and where, are they, where are they all going? Steve, who do you normally vote for? Well, do you know what? My, my parents are Labour voters. No, I didn't. I didn't you ask know? about your parents. I asked about you. Yeah, but, but well, well, to be honest, I, I normally abstain because at half time. Everything they say is just all rubbish anyway. They never do, they, they never do what they But, but you care enough to phone in to talk to the deputy leader I of the do, Labour I, Party. I, I, I do, I do, and I'm so glad I've got through because they're not listening. They're not listening. They're, the Labour so idea, what, what are you going to do at the next know, election then? But, we, but well, you know... It's, it's going to be UKIP. It's got to be UKIP. The only, the only way we're going to get a control on this it's about you, Kim. Uh, 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 OK, Harry, OK, Harry, st OK, Steve. Uh, le leave it there for a second. Um, Harriet, Steve exemplifies your party's problem, doesn't he? Because he comes from a traditional Labour Party background, or at least his parents always voted Labour. I suspect he has in the past, even if he's abstained recently. He's now going to go to UKIP. How on earth can you get him back in the next seven months? Well, I think that there is a big issue here, which is that are people better off in terms of their standard of living, their job opportunities, their future prospects? Are people like Steve and everybody around better off by us cutting off our links with Europe and cutting ourselves a drink adrift? And actually... I know there are problems in relation to the free movement of labour and we've got a number of proposals that we've got that we say we would try and tackle them, one of which um, is about what I talked about of undercutting wages. But I think that for all the problems that there are, if we cut ourselves off from Europe, then we would find things very difficult and people would be worse off. And then we would find, actually, that, you know, we wished we were still part of that big market Fine. But to that, be that able pitch to sell is not, our... that pitch is not going to convince people like Steve, is it? Well, if you want... If we want investment in this country, in our industries like the car industry, the, these industries actually say they are happy to come and invest in this, uh, in the UK because we are part of Europe. And actually, we're not, you know, we should be having this discussion about are you going to be better or worse off if you cut yourself adrift? And we have a clear position okay. on that, which is we think that we are better off in, in Europe and therefore we're not proposing straight out there should be an in-out referendum because we're not proposing that we should leave Europe, but we are saying if there were some big future changes which somehow transferred powers to Europe, which we think is unlikely to happen anyway, that at that point there should be an in-out referendum. OK, Steve, thank you very much indeed for your call. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can now watch us via our website. There is a link on the front page now, lbc.co.uk. Uh, we have the webcams uh, switched on. Uh, now we're going to give you advance notice of the next question because we'll answer it after the news. And I say we'll answer it, the royal we. Um, Steve's in Basildon. Hello, Steve. Hello, uh, my name's Steve. Um, nice to speak to you again. Uh, I'd just last, like to ask, are we the Labour, and I'm a UKIP voter now, but the old Labour people, uh, just wondered whether we're going to actually vote for new Labour, which was the thing that Blair turned on us, or are actually going to vote for Labour this time. Because it seemed to me that last time when I voted Labour, which was when Blair got in, he switched tables on me and sat there and told us, oh, well, we're, now, we're now new Labour. And we ended up with a situation with open immigration. 
So I, I suppose to sum that up, is old Labour back or is still is new Labour still around? Don't answer it now. You've got three minutes to prepare a stonking answer, Harriet. We'll come back to you uh, in three minutes' time. Um, I'm Ian Dale at Drive. You're listening to Call Harriet here on LBC. It's 7.30, news time. Simon Conway has the news headlines. Heathrow's Terminal 1 will see the first screening for Ebola in the UK from tomorrow. Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt says officials believe there could be a handful of cases of the virus in the UK in the next few months. The government has caused anger among unions by saying thousands of nurses' jobs would have to be cut to give them all a 1% wage rise. Hundreds of thousands of health workers across England and Northern Ireland went on strike this morning over pay. Harriet Harman says Labour needs to make its position on immigration clear, taking your calls on LBC. The deputy Labour leader says new measures need to be put in place to deal with foreign nationals who break the law. If somebody's committed a serious criminal offence in their country of origin, they shouldn't therefore necessarily be automatically entitled as part of the European Union to come and live and work here. And secondly, if somebody comes here from another European Union country and then break the rules by committing an offence, I think they should then be sent back to their own country. The Business News, the Shadow Transport Secretary has told LBC the government is rushing into plans to sell off the UK's 40% stake in Eurostar. Mary Cray says the move should not go ahead until a review into government privatisations is finished. 1,000 UK jobs are to be created by Amazon. The positions will be across the internet retailers' eight distribution centres and will take the total number of UK-based staff to 7,000. Three of the UK's supermarkets are cutting the price of fuel. Tesco, Sainsbury's and Asda are taking up to two pence a litre off diesel and a penny off unleaded from tomorrow. It follows another drop in the price of oil, taking it to a four-year low. And in the city, the FTSE 100 closed up 26 at 63.66. LBC Business. With Nectar Business, the loyalty programme where collecting points is easy. And LBC weather, mainly cloudy tonight for London and the South East. Showers continuing, but some drier spells too. Lows of 10 Celsius. Further outbreaks of rain across England and Wales, but drier further north. Tomorrow, a mixture of showers and sunny spells. Highs of 16 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Simon Conway. Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. We've got some problems on the M11, a very slow northbound away from London after a lorry broke down near Harlow at Junction 7. It's on the exit slip, partly blocking the exit slip to the Hastingwood roundabout. Because of that, lots of you queuing back on to the main carriageway of the northbound M11. The queue's all the way back past the M25 towards Loughton at Junction 5, so it's going to take an extra 40 to 50 minutes to get through those queues. So there's going to be reports of a multi-car accident on the M1 one northbound uh, at Junction 11. The exit slipped to Dunstable, partly blocked after a multi-car accident. That's causing some queues back on to the main carriageway. M23, very slow at the moment, both ways through the roadworks between the M25 and Junction 9 at Gatwick Airport. Also had reports of a broken down car in the queues there on the exit slip to the airport, causing extra congestion. M60 clockwise, a lane shut after a lorry broke down Junction 11 at Barton. Keeping you moving, your next travel update is in 15 minutes. LBC Travel. With GoToMeeting. Leave travel behind and stay ahead of the game. The PPI mis-selling saga has been going on for years. If you're concerned that you've left it too late to claim your PPI back, think again. Direct Redress have claimed back millions of pounds for clients that were victims of the PPI scandal, even if you don't have any agreement numbers or original paperwork. To find out more, text the word PPI to 87121. That's PPI to 87121. Direct redress. Experts in financial claims. Come on, guys. This is a really big offer. The British Gas Big Autumn Boiler Offer is now on. Buy a new A-rated energy-efficient boiler from British Gas and you'll get a £400 scrappage discount for replacing your old one. Plus, boiler and central heating care and free plumbing drains and home electrical cover. But that's not all. With our fixed price guarantee, the price we say is the price you pay. You'll have to hurry, though. The big autumn boiler offer ends on the 30th of October. So call 0800 754 754 today or visit britishgas.co.uk. Conditions apply. Hello, have you been missold oh, PPI? Oh, no! Has anyone you know been missold P- No! Oh! Hello, has your dog or- No! I'm waiting for an important call! 
Hi, Becky. Great news. We've decided to give you the job. I don't care! Oh. With Nuisance Call Block on Panasonic cordless phones, you get the calls you want, not the ones you don't. Find Panasonic phones with Nuisance Call Block at Tesco. Subscription to caller ID required. There are many things a mother can pass on to her baby. Her smile, her eye colour, and her immunity to whooping cough. A simple vaccination during your pregnancy can help to protect your baby in their first weeks. Please speak to your GP, nurse, or healthcare professional and pass on your immunity. 118434. 118434. What are you doing? Trying to remember a number. Do you want to borrow my pen? 118434. Now there's only one number to remember. 118434. The handy number for handy numbers. Calls cost 76 pence plus £1.53 per minute from a BT landline. Other networks vary and mobiles cost considerably more. Ian Dale at Drive on LBC. With racars.co.uk. Discover over 80,000 quarters quality used cars for sale. This is Call Harriet here on LBC. We're leading Britain's conversation until 8, so you still have just over 20 minutes to get your calls in. Get in touch by calling 0345 6060 Text me on 84850 or you can tweet us at LBC. So that's Harriet Harman with Ian Dale leading Britain's conversation. Now, Steve in Basildon had a question before the break. He was essentially saying, um, are Ed's, uh, Labour, is Ed's Labour Party old Labour or new Labour? He's, he seems a bit lost. It's, it's the Labour Party. It's the, it's the Labour Party with the same principles and values that I joined over 30 years ago. That so believes, it's old Labour? Well, it's... It labor it, it it goes it deals with different challenges at different times and gets different labels on it but the principles and values remain absolutely the same which which is that we need a good health care system and that is the job of government to provide a good health care system for everybody that everybody should get a fair chance in life and just because you're born into uh, you know a family with plenty of money doesn't mean you're better than anybody else and everybody should get a fair deal and the job of government is to make sure that that's possible that people have got jobs but where they don't have a job that there's a safety net for them so that has always been the principles of the Labour Party and uh, obviously at different the principles times of the Conservative Party or indeed the Liberal Democrats no I don't think they are really? I, no I absolutely which don't of those think. wouldn't be a principle for the other parties I mean I, look at the health service for a start I mean when they were in government I remember people when I was first an MP people used to come into my advice surgery and literally be on a waiting list for two years for a hip replacement in floods of tears. But in the Tories would say, go private and we'll give you tax relief on private health insurance. And they were just letting the NHS fall apart. And I think that's one of the, the big issues. That, that And it's partly because we believe that actually everybody should look out for and look after each other. And it's not the devil take the hindmost, which I think is a sort of individual philosophy of the Tories, which is great if you're right at the top, um, but actually it's not great for everybody else and it's not great for the country as a whole either. Well, what, what about Steve's point, though, that he, he's confused? Tony Blair was always advocating new Labour, sort of old Labour was a thing of the past. Is new Labour a thing of the past now? Well, I think that, you know, the challenges are different now. It's not so much the issue of people not being able to get a job, although there is still too much unemployment, but there's the question of insecurity at work. In, in the past, when Tony Blair was first Prime Minister, we didn't have zero-hours contracts. We didn't have so many people working part-time because they couldn't get full-time hours. We didn't have people endlessly on temporary contracts. There's insecurity in the labour market. So that that is an issue, which is a new issue, which Labour has got its principles and concerns and, and wants to tackle. So as oh, the issues well, change... Well, I put it to her, and then what he yeah. did, he went to an advert. Uh, Steve... Oh, yeah. I know, that wasn't my fault, Steve, honestly. Blame the um, <laughs> management here, you know. They switched okay. on that okay. ad. Steve, Steve, I've tried, to, I, I've tried to get out of Harriet sort of the difference between old Labour and new Labour. Are, you, are you satisfied? No, not at all. I'm, I'm just as bemused as when I first started because, to be honest with you, um, I'm working class, man. I've worked all my life. I felt utterly let down by the Labour government last time. Tony Blair did an awful job at, uh, for us. Well, it's he, why won, he, won three he won three elections. Yeah, I know. But look at the damage he did. 
He was no better than Thatcher. In actual fact, he could have been Thatcher's son, as far as I was concerned. He moved himself away from the Labour Party. Well, I believe well, uh, that so, so the you, unions... So you, you, want, been... you want to vote for a Thatcherite party, then, UKIP? No, no. Uh, well, the thing is, is I want to vote for a party that's going to do something for the ordinary working man out here. And unfortunately, regardless of which way you look at it, mass immigration, and I'm not just talking about Europe, because the truth is... 70% of the immigrants that came into this country were outside of Europe when Blair let in the three million, and that's just a figure that was pulled out of the air. I'm not even sure that that's, that's truly right. Um, so that leaves 30% were only Eastern European, so it, it, or European, I should say. So that, so that leaves us with a situation that it's the open door immigration situation that's the biggest problem in this country, as far as I'm aware. But it's that 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 coupled with our politicians will not give us another option. And I don't believe what the Tories are saying. They said they were going to give us some form of referendum last time, and they didn't. And I don't believe they're going to give us one now. Labour won't give us one. So where do we go? Okay, Steve. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that that's I mean, two two calls there that you've heard from. I'm, exemplify the problem that I think Labour had in the Hayward and Middleton by-election. Um, people who are just fed up, not just with Labour, but frankly with the, with the whole political system, and they see UKIP as a way out. That has to concern you. Well, I think there's two things. One is um, immigration um, and Europe, and the other is people's general feeling that um, you know traditional politics doesn't deliver for them. What's the point? of voting for any of the main parties. And I think that that is a challenge for us and we've got a job to do on that. But I think that not voting and just feeling despairing, I think people have people are entitled to have a sense that there's a party that could be in government that could make a difference to their lives and that is the challenge okay. for us to do that. Um, John has tweeted, in an answer to Steve's question, is it old Labour or new Labour, could it just be refurbished Labour? Well, that, there's an interesting one. You can watch us on the website, lbc.co.uk the webcams are switched on. Shall it's we just today's Labour. Today's Labour. That's, that's quite a good one, I like that. Shall we have another call? Okay, shall we go to Danny in Highgate? Danny, what's your question? Oh, hi. Um, hi. Just a short question from me, Harriet. Um, there are around 147 female MPs at the moment. Um, there are about 27 black and ethnic MPs out of 650 possible seats. Um, and since you're such a firm supporter of all women shortlists, would you back an all-black shortlist to get more black people and ethnic people into Parliament? Well, I, I am a fervent supporter of all women shortlists and it has been the way that we've actually got more women into Parliament and made Parliament more representative. It was absolutely ridiculous when I was first an MP. 50% of the country's women, but only 3% of Parliament was women. And the only way we managed it is by all women shortlists, which people might not know, but it's quite a draconian measure which basically says that when you're choosing an, an MP for the Labour Party or choosing a candidate for the Labour Party that in a particular constituency you have as wide a range of choices as you want as long as it's a woman. So, I mean, that is quite a drastic policy, but it did bring women into the House of Commons. I think that we are concerned to make sure that Parliament is more representative and reflects the black and minority Asian communities in this country because Parliament is supposed to be representative. Now, in the Labour Party, we've got more black and Asian members of Parliament than all the other parties put together, but we still don't... Yes, we do. Absolutely. Um, but we don't actually have the same percentage of, as are in the population. And I think people want to look on the green benches of the House of Commons and see people from all walks of life and all backgrounds and all colours there because that's what this country's like. But as far as your point about should we have all black shortlists and say in this constituency we have got to have a black or Asian MP and no white person can actually apply for it, the difficulty for that is... Um, how would you actually choose where you would do that? And, you know, well, it's pretty easy... Say, say for example, um, a seat where there is more than 50% of the population that is non-white. That, that would be logical, wouldn't it? Well, not necessarily, because we have some, you know, black and Asian MPs that represent constituencies that are largely white, like Chi and Wurra. Um, 
uh, who's up in the northeast. Um, she represents a constituency. She's minority ethnic background, but she represents a constituency um, which is not a particularly minority ethnic con- constituency. I, I think that we we need to do everything we can to make sure that people who are from a black and Asian background are not just voting, but actually able to be part of the decision making. And that is fairness. But so I don't I, think it's straightforward so what you're as is, having all black shorts. So it's unworkable, effectively. Well, I think, you know, we need to look at how we, you know, what are all the different ways we can do it. But there is, it, there was a kind of quite straightforward, albeit unpopular answer on women. But there isn't a straightforward and uh, way of doing it in relation to getting more black and Asian people in. But Um, we have made some progress and we need to make some more. My exhaustive research um, on this subject while we've been on air is that there are 13 Labour MPs with a BME background and 11 Conservatives. So it's it's hardly sort of an earth-shattering majority. No, but we're in opposition, so we've got a smaller number of MPs, and they're in government, but <laughs> okay. they've still got fewer. Um, Dan, you know, at the end of the day, we, we are the party which is about making Parliament more representative, and they are the Conservatives. It's the clues in the name. Danny, a very quick word yeah. from you. Well, you said um, it was 3% um, women when you first came into government, um, which is ridiculous, um, being that there were 50% women in the country. I mean, there's 4.1 percent approximately representation of um, black and ethnic. Um, I just maybe that is a drastic measure, but I think something needs to be done. Would you agree? And would you look into that? Well, we we do look into it on a regular basis. And we had um, when we were in government, we got an organisation called Operation Black Vote to look into um, how we might be able to um, open up more opportunities for black and Asian people to come. Um, into the House of Commons. And I think this is not just about doing those people a favour and say, oh, go on, let them in then. It's actually about strengthening our democracy by making our parliament more representative. It's a bit like with the police. Is It's not just, oh, well, if somebody who's black or Asian wants to be a policeman in London, let them. We actually need our uh, police in London to be representative of London as a whole. So... Okay. We, we need to make more progress. Danny, thank you very much for a very interesting question. A very facetious tweet here from Clive, who says, does Harriet's husband, Jack, still wear a skirt from the days he was selected from an all-women shortlist? Well, there's an answer to that. Is that even I, keen as I am about having more women MPs, <laughs> don't think there should be 100% women MPs. Well, you heard it here first. Uh, we will have more of your questions to Harriet Harman in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. This is LBC at 7.47. This is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. Well, some long delays on the M11 northbound, queuing all the way from Loughton at Junction 5 up to the exit for Harlow, Junction 7. That's been caused by a lorry which broke down earlier this afternoon. It's still partly blocking the northbound exit slip at Junction 7. That's the reason for the queues back past the M25 down to Luton. At least 40 to 50 minutes of delays there. Uh, delays also on the M1 northbound. There's a lane closed on the exit slip at Dunstable. That's Junction 11. Multi-car accident there on the exit slip. That's causing some queues back on to the main carriageway. M23 still slow this evening through the roadworks between the M25 and Junction 9 for Gatwick Airport. In Manchester, the M60 clockwise lane shut after a lorry broke down at Junction 11 for Barton. In Lincolnshire at West Keel, the A16's being closed both ways because of flooding. That's shut at Main Road. And Ipswich Road at Keswick in Norwich, the A140 is blocked both ways after an accident. Keeping you moving. Your next travel update is in half an hour. L- BC Travel with GoToMeeting. Relieve the stress. Hold your meeting online from anywhere. Ian Dale at Drive on LBC. With raccars.co.uk. Get your current car valued for free. James O'Brien, weekday mornings from 10 on LBC. Here's the thing, so anonymous trolls who revel in their freedom to be horribly abusive on social media about people they've never met are up in arms about my suggestion that they're probably cowardly idiots. How do I know that? Because they're trolling me horribly and anonymously on social media. James O'Brien on LBC with Nectar Business, the loyalty programme small businesses need to know about. 118434, the handy number for handy numbers. Calls cost 76 pence plus £1.53 per minute from a BT landline. Other networks vary and mobiles cost considerably more. If you had the heating on, you wouldn't leave the front door open, would you? And you'd close all the windows too, right? But if your loft isn't insulated, you may as well be leaving your roof open. 
Working with the government, British Gas is rolling out free insulation for 90% of homes that need it. You don't even need to be a British Gas customer or own your own home to be one of the millions now eligible. Call 0800 141 3222 or visit britishgas.co.uk forward slash insulation. Conditions and exclusions apply. The PPI mis-selling saga has been going on for years. If you're concerned that you've left it too late to claim your PPI back, think again. Direct Redress have claimed back millions of pounds for clients that were victims of the PPI scandal, even if you don't have any agreement numbers or original paperwork. To find out more, text the word PPI to 87121. That's PPI to 87121. Direct Redress. Experts in financial claims. Do you know, I've never got a seat on this train. Been commuting for 12 years and never sat down. I worked it out. 41 minutes a day, five days a week, 48 weeks a year for 12 years. That's 1,872 hours I've been standing. 82 days. Phileas Fogg went round the world in less. I just want to get to Charing Cross. Commuting getting you down. Then download GoToMeeting by Citrix and you can hold face-to-face meetings wherever you are. Visit gotomeeting.co.uk for a free 30-day trial. Who knows what lies in wait for the unsuspecting used car buyer? What lurks beneath the bonnet? We do. At RAC Cars, we only work with carefully selected dealers to make sure the car you want has had a history check, a multi-point inspection, comes with a warranty and six months free breakdown cover. Search for your next car today at raccars.co.uk and get your current car valued for free. Motorists, we salute you. Minimum one month warranty, vehicle based roadside rescue cover, new customers only. Terms and conditions apply. Fast food takeaways could be banned from opening within 10 minutes walk of schools under radical plans being considered by Boris Johnson. The report commissioned by the mayor urges a tough line to tackle a health crisis that leaves one in three 10-year-olds overweight or obese. But would banning takeaways near schools really make a difference? Harriet Harman on LBC. Well, that was Clive Bull. Coming up from eight, make sure you stick around for that. Ten minutes left for you to get your calls into me, Harriet Harman, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Um, you can call us on 0345 6060973. Sure, we have a couple of texts and emails before we go to our next call, who will be Rebecca in Hendon. Um, Sheena in Archway says, Do you support striking midwives? How much should our pay be increased by? Um, I do think that there should be a settlement with the with the midwives. I'm dismayed that the pay review body's recommendation, uh, which takes into account the straightened financial public finances, but actually looks at what's happened um, to the pay of midwives. I know that the midwives haven't been on strike in decades, so I think it shows the level of concern. And I also know that if they hadn't have spent um, £5 billion on a reorganisation of the NHS, the Tories, in breach of their manifesto promise, there might be more money around to be paying the midwives. So I think that wasting money on agency staff because there's such a turnover of midwives because they're not paid enough um, to retain them, I'm very sympathetic to the midwives' cause. Do, Do you know what the top pay for a midwife is? In the absolute top management. Well, no, the, the, if you're a midwife, the, the, the sort of high, highest point at the scale, um, I found out earlier, was £32,000. Um, and I mean, that's after many years of experience and many babies absolutely. safely delivered. Uh, that's what you get after nine years, and, and you can't go above that. So, I mean, I, that doesn't seem to me to be a very high wage when you bear in mind some like tube drivers get £45,000, £50,000 a, a year. What, what do you think they ought to get? Well, I think that it ought to be the recommendations of the independent pay review body. This is quite a sort of... You have to look into all the training issues. You have to look at whether you're managing to recruit the right people. It's not for me to pluck a figure out of the air, but I know they wouldn't be going on on strike, um, although they are actually doing emergency cases, if they wouldn't feel absolutely desperate and driven to it. Do you not think they should get more than tube drivers, though? Um, well, there is an issue, actually, about men's pay and women's pay here because those jobs which are mostly done by men tend to be higher paid than jobs which are mostly done by women. And I think a lot of people would think a job of delivering babies is every bit as important in terms of saving people's lives and keeping people safe as driving a tube. But because traditionally uh, tube jobs have been done by men I th- and 
traditionally midwives are women. That is part of your undervaluing well, of women's work. Nice, easy question here. Margaret in Wallingham, how, out of all of the party leader speeches at conference, which one made the best speech? Well, Ed Miliband made the best speech, obviously. No, that's not quite what say. the general public think, is it? Well, you know, the general public can, you know, speak for themselves, but actually well, come on. I'm answering I mean, he, that he question. For, he forgot to ask about the, uh, talk about the deficit, he forgot to talk about immigration. By no standard was that the best of the three speeches. Well, I don't agree with what the other party leader said, and it's not a technical issue of speech presentation. It's what's it's in their heart and it's soul, and, what's, yeah, and what do they believe about the future for this country? And what does it say about Ed Miliband that he forgot to talk about the deficit? Well... David Cameron seemed to forgot to govern for the whole of this country and just think he's there for a privileged few. Nick Clegg, you, I can't believe what he's saying because he does the opposite from what he's actually saying. Ed Miliband understands the concerns people have got and is determined to stand up and fight for them. So, you know, it's not a question of technicalities. You know, I've, it's a question of what's in your heart and what you stand for and what you believe to be the problems in this country. And I think he okay. gets those problems. All right, let's go to Rebecca in Hendon. Hello, Rebecca. Good evening. Hi. Um, hi, Harriet. Hi. Following Nick Clegg's speech at the Lib Dem conference, you criticised him quite heavily, accusing him of being untrustworthy. If you failed to win a majority in 2015, would you demand Mr Clegg's resignation before considering forming a coalition government with the Lib Dems? Well, I think what what I'm saying about the Lib Dems is that is that when they say to people, vote for us because X and Y, they've shown over the last period that actually that's not what they're going to do. And I think that Tories, and therefore that's our reason to break all their promises, I don't think that's good enough. But I don't think it's actually about personalities, although he is the leader of the party. And I don't really want to get into the issue about... Um, entering a coalition, uh, considering entering a coalition with the Lib Dems, because we want to have an overall majority. We want to be able to well, say we take, to the we people... We take that as yeah. red, but we know with the parliamentary arithmetic, with the SNP likely to take more seats at the election, with, with UKIP possibly winning a few as well, uh, a hung parliament is, is a strong possibility, isn't it? I mean, we, we, all, we can all recognise that. Well, I'm not a commentator, and I'm not second-guessing the voters, and I'm not doing hypotheses no, of what might you're happen. No, but you're a player, and, a, and, and as a player, you will have a, a big voice in, in who you talk to after but the election if player, this happens. But as a player, I can say that if I start talking about, oh, what will happen when, when we don't win the election, that actually is not helpful to our campaign. We have to be campaigning to win the but election, don't, don't not the, discussing what will happen if we don't. Don't the voters have a right to know which party or which party leader you would most like to go into coalition with before the election and what your red lines in those negotiations would be? No, I think the general public have got a right to know what we say we believe in, what we think are the problems in this country, what we would do about the health service, what we do about jobs. I think that's what we need to be setting forth and they want to be hearing, not discussing, you know, um, who's going to appear with who in the Rose Garden of number 10. I, I think okay. that actually coalition Rebecca, has been quickly. a bad thing. You can't pretend that you're just going to win a majority like that. I mean, the polls consistently say, you know, you and the Conservatives are 34, 35 percent. And you can't deny that there is a high likelihood of a hung parliament. And, and you just said coalition has been a bad thing. What, would a coalition with Labour necessarily be a bad thing? Well, I think it's better for people to be setting forth what their proposals are and then keeping their promises when they get into power. Um, and I think that the fact that we've had a party, which is the Lib Dems, promising something and then doing the opposite i think is 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 not good for politics so um and also i i really do kind of defend my right not to get into a commentary about what might happen we are here to not to predict the future but to actually well, shape the future i, I, I know that I, I sounds can, a bit grand but I can, that, I can, <laughs> we're doing our best i can bet that over the next seven months before the election that those kind of questions are going to be put to you time and time again that's all we have time for tonight harriet thank you very much we'll be seeing harriet again uh, in about four weeks time for another edition of call harriet that's me done for another day i'll be back tomorrow at four duncan barks is here at 10 now it's clive ball ian thanks very much and coming up at nine o'clock uh, i'll be bringing you the money hour when